I want to talk to you for a little bit tonight uh, before I kind of go into the crux of the teaching. I want to talk to you tonight about the challenges of being designed for more. And the chief challenge is that the first thing you'll discover is you don't fit in places that were designed for less. And although everybody might have the language of more, few are willing to go through the process of the transformation of the wineskin in order that the wineskin may be able to hold the more that it was ultimately designed for. So if we could stay exactly like we are and get more, everybody would want more. And many believe they can. And that the reason they're not in more is a timing issue. And if they keep doing the exact same familiar things that they've been doing, that sooner or later the more is just going to come invade the normal that they've given their lives to. But more is not looking for normal because more and normal can't speak to each other. Deep only talks to deep. Therefore, it would be true in the law of inversion that only shallow can speak to shallow. And for those of you that were designed for more, I'm thankful that Yahweh in his goodness is carving out places where you can come, not, not that this is the only one by any stretch of the imagination, but we long for this to come, up, come become a place where you can come and drink from a fountain that may be unfamiliar to you and that can cause you to be infused with this sense of hope that there is more. Say more. Yes. All right, let me read a couple of things to you I've written here lately and then I'm going to jump into this text and talk to you about some of the reasons why I believe you and I don't alter find the access to more that we long for. You ready? Your hunger and thirst for more is quite likely the very thing that would not enable you to fit in the Western system of religion. Now you will have to allow grace, assisted by the spirit of revelation, to sweep the leaven of legalism out of those corners of your thinking that assume that you will get to more by doubling down on the familiar. More of the same can only produce more of what the same has already produced. We are now being invited into the unfamiliar where what eye has not seen and ear has not heard is waiting to reveal itself to you and I. I'm going to read that one more time. Your hunger and thirst for more is quite likely the very thing that would not enable you to fit in the Western system of religion. Now you will have to allow grace, assisted by the spirit of revelation, to sweep the leaven of legalism out of those corners of your thinking that assume that you will get to more by doubling down on the familiar. More of the same can only produce more of what the same has already produced. We are now being invited into the unfamiliar where what eye has not seen and ear has not heard is waiting to reveal itself to you and I. One more, we must receive grace to both perceive and understand our own journeys through the lens of theosis. This is about so much more than what you and I are called to do, but more importantly, this journey is about what you and I are called to become. You're not primarily being prepared to do a task, but rather you are principally being prepared to become a pattern. Let me say again. You're not primarily being prepared to do a task, but rather you are principally being prepared to become a pattern. An image bearer in the midst of a culture that has forgotten the rock that begat her. What if, just what if, all of the journey, challenges, and struggles have been preparing you for this specific hour, the hour where you and I begin to step into the more that we have cried out for, as well as the more that we have been predestined to become. Say more. More. Mm. If you long for nothing more than to be a converted lost sinner that is rescued from eternal judgment, then this message is probably not for you. However, the message in most Western churches will suit you just fine. But if you, like me, believe that we are called to represent Jesus in the same way that Jesus was called to represent Abba, that's John 17, then I am convinced that we are recovering a patristic Christology that will indeed reform our ideas about what it actually means to be saved. Not simply what we have been saved from, but far more significant is whom we have been saved for or he whom we have been saved for. Salvation will either mean for you a future entrance into heaven or an immediate access into union. Which way we choose to travel at this great fork in the road will have an enormous impact on the state of a cosmos in disarray. 
We are indeed standing at a crossroads, and I can hear the Holy Spirit beckoning us through the words of Jeremiah, choose the ancient path, the Olam path, and it will go well with you. And may I add that according to Romans 8, it will also go well for the whole of the created order, the cosmos. What we choose to do right here, right now, feels historically and cosmically significant. Choose well. I think there's a tension in perceiving the greatness of an hour that we've been called into. And the tension is we have so developed a poor definition of humility that we've lost confidence in the name of humility. Humilitas is a Latin word and it literally means from the dirt. And in essence, humility is to know who you came from. Therefore, humility by definition is you and I coming into agreement with God's perspective concerning our original design. And there was such a confidence for those who had followed Yeshua for three and a half years that with a small crowd of 120 people locked in in an upper room for fear of the Jews... That when the outpouring of the Spirit happened, 120 people said, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams upon my male and female servants in that day. Will I pour out my Spirit, says the Lord. 120 people dared to believe that verse was written specifically about them. You talk about arrogant. Unless they were absolutely right. And I, I ha- one of the tests I'm having to pass as a leader in my own heart is uh, n- not to be overexcited about this because we're leading it. But I don't think I'm overexcited about it because we're leading it because I've been leading some other things I wasn't all that doggone excited about. <laughs> but the excitement concerning this is that we're able to watch the fruit of the impact it's having now on multiple generations that are beginning to find a source and sense of what life is all about that's bringing about for them a supernatural transformation. The problem with more is more never visits the wineskin that was prepared for less. So the first thing that has to happen is not a radical change in thinking where Jesus becomes an accoutrement to the lifestyle that we've been living all along, but this invitation into the kingdom is actually an invitation to forsake every other thing that is an insult to the life that has been offered to us by the way of the king and his kingdom. And so it it, it doesn't work. This lifestyle, this move, this experience we're having in the things of God, even this level of encounter, it does not work with a casual connection. It takes an intense measure of intentionality for you to begin to say, I'm not going to flirt with what the Lord is saying to me in this hour, but I'm going to become immersed in what I feel the Lord's saying to me in this hour. And one of the great assistants, I believe, that enables you and I to be able to be seated in a revelation, this is what we're going to talk about tonight, is that revelation would not be something that simply moves in the ear and would even go beyond something that moves the heart, but revelation would actually establish a root system. Our, our logo here that the team put together for us, it's up there on the screen tonight. It says, uh, the Homestead Mobile, Alabama, a kingdom family rooted in beloved identity. There's a difference between a revelation having touched you and one rooting you. And what I'm looking for is for people that when they hear the message of beloved righteousness, it so resonates in the deepest parts of who they are that they recognize this cannot be one of the truths that I add to my other list of truths. This has to become the core of all that constitutes my identity. I am one loved with the same nature and measure of love that the Father has for his beloved son, Yeshua. And if that doesn't change everything, I wonder if you really heard it. Because there's not a person in this room that believes that, me included, yet. That we're loved with the same nature and measure of love that the Father has. The ones that will get it first will be these. 
because they won't have to unlearn near as many years of how they thought the father felt about them to dare to believe that the benchmark for us, for you and I right now, for how the father feels concerning us is the exact nature and measure of love that he had for his son, Yeshua. Let that go boom in you. Not go, yeah, that sounds, that's, I'm not talking about a doctrine right now. I'm talking about a transformational reality. That all of a sudden, every decision you make is from a sense of one beloved. Every reaction to a situation is from the sense of one beloved. Now, don't beat yourself up that you're not there yet. I'm not there yet either, but I'm determined. That I am going to allow the sense of the Father's fascination with me to become everything that rules me, spirit, soul, and body. That even on an emotional level, I begin to respond out of the greatness of the pure sense of I have been accepted, I have been celebrated, and now I am being seated in a revelation. And I think the danger with revelation is this. I think the danger with revelation is that we don't draw a distinct enough line between revelation and information. Many of us grew up in church for years and never heard anything but information. The difference between information and revelation is one comes as a secondary consequence of intellect. The other comes as a secondary consequence of encounter. You don't get revelation from reading a lot. You get revelation from listening a lot. Right? And so when we, what is the difference between the individual who may be operating in information and the individual who may be operating in revelation? The individual operating in information will always move in their gifts in such a way that it draws attention to the individual. The individual moving in revelation will draw attention away from themselves to bring attention back to Christ so that he becomes the predominant pursuit of all of those that are sitting under the leaven of the teaching of the kingdom of God. And so the shift in our thinking has to be, we have to make sure that we don't categorize the things the Lord's teaching us in this day of of significant downloads of revelation by way of encounter, that we don't go categorize that with other things that we called revelation that really were information. I've heard profound sermons from people that I knew were living nefarious lifestyles. And you ask the question, how are they doing that? How can you be there and have revelation? It can't be revelation, but it can be information. And that person could be teaching you on history. That person could be teaching you on philosophy. That person could be teaching you on literature. It doesn't matter what it is. There's a gift. And for those of us that have been given that gift, we understand how easy it is to move out of revelation over into information. And there's no specific lifestyle that leads you to information. The gift alone can bring information. But revelation is something that when people hear it, it moves them beyond the realm of their thinking and it begins to affect the way of their being. You have to think right to be right, but right thinking is not right being. Right thinking is the gate to right being. Repenting is the gate to righteousness. Righteousness is you being as you ought to be. And the way you get there is by changing the way you think. So it's actually incorrect for you and I to cry out for more because we're hearing something we enjoy and not wanting to build our lives now around the significance of what it is the Lord's showing us. And I think that's what, you know, what Bill Johnson meant when he talked about never changing the subject. Them experiencing a great move of the Spirit when he was pastoring in the mountains in Redding and Weaverville, sorry, in Weaverville, California. God visited them with a great move of the Spirit. And after a while, the Spirit began to wane or began to come and it began to go. And he asked the Lord, he said, what, what, why, what do I have to do to never lose what we had in that hour? And he knew he felt the revelation that if he, he told God, if you'll send us another outpouring of the Spirit, I'll never change the subject. In other words, I'll never take revival and try to add it to everything else that we're doing. And I I feel that way with beloved identity. I refuse to take the revelation of beloved righteousness and make it one of a bunch of other things in a list. You're going to love because he first loved you. Right? And so you and I coming into the fullness of the revelation of how the father feels about us, not because of Jesus revealed through Jesus. God does not love you because of Jesus. Many of you have gotten in the presence of the Father and say, look at Jesus, look at Jesus, don't look at me, don't look at me, look at Jesus. No, he wants to look at you. He's fascinated with you. He's crazy about you. And Jesus didn't come to make the Father that way. He came to reveal to you the Father has been that way all along. Massive difference. 
You don't love me because of Jesus. Jesus is the proof of how much you love me. And Jesus came to reveal how you feel about me. And this has got to move us into a posture where we're able to specifically as leaders say, then everything that caused me to fear going all in just got devoured by the revelation that I am so beloved that I'm actually very safe. Trust. The second conversion. And this is where that gate to tenderness comes from. So let's jump into some teaching tonight. Are you ready for this? How many of you are staying for the next couple of days as well? Okay, let me put, put that hand down. How many of you are not staying for the next couple of days? You got to go back home. Okay, probably 50-50, Brian, just so we know based on numbers how many folks we're going to try to squeeze into this tin can over the next couple of days. It's going to be awesome. We've got faith for the building to expand. Loaves and fish can multiply, so can, so can square footage. So. I'm going to give you, I think I gave them like 14 scripture, scripture references tonight. It's a leadership gathering, so just brace yourself. They're not super long, but they're important. Some years ago, and I tried to go back and, and, and even determine when it was, I couldn't find the notes. Couldn't, I, there, I've got notes kind of everywhere right now. I've got storage unit notes. I've got notes at one house. I've got notes in another house. I've got notes in my office. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I tried to determine when it was, and it, it looks to me like somewhere between seven and eight years ago, the Lord began to give me a revelation around the idea of people moving out uh, let, me, let me see. I wrote it down. I want to make sure I get it right. Moving out of the affliction of wandering or the what I called the curse of rootlessness and accepting the grace to come home. Now, I want to make sure that you understand several things. One is home does not always have to do with geography, but sometimes it does. And it'll be you, up to you to determine in here by the spirit what it takes for you to get rooted but I believe I'm here to serve to you as a witness that spiritual authority in your life is not about bringing about restriction. Spiritual authority is about giving you permission to become rooted. And the reason why people see spiritual authority as restrictive is two reasons. One, it's been abused and it's been used in a restrictive fashion. Okay. Secondly, we don't have enough people yet declaring the greatness of what happened in their lives when they set themselves under spiritual authority. And so then you, you have a lot of people now who, even inside of this message and inside of this revelation, want to uh, ensure that we're not creating some kind of hierarchical structure. We're not creating a hierarchical structure, but we are responding to one that the Father has designed from the beginning. And that revelation is fathers and sons and fathers and sons and one generation commending your kingdom to another generation in a democratic society royal secession is something hard to teach because we think we get to position of authority by way of being voted there and in the kingdom you get to position of authority by way of being connected to the progenitor amen and so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about this tonight, and I think it's important because I'm looking at leaders and I'm going, how do we, maybe I come into a gathering like this, how do we expand the family tree? How do we enable people who are hearing this message who want to do more than just listen from a distance, but actually want to get grafted into what the Lord's doing? Now, now, some of you may be in the room and say, I'm content to just listen to the message. It's helping me. Praise God. Bless me. Awesome. That's, uh, that one's easy. But I do want to talk to the people who, when they hear this, go, I feel like that's my lifeline. And I talked to a bunch of you out there today. And you're going, that's my lifeline. How do I get more connected to what the Lord's doing? And maybe you're called to move here and this will help you. Maybe you're called to be where you are and this will help you. Maybe you're called to be somewhere completely different than here or there and this will help you. But I do know this, you are not designed to walk this out by yourself. And independence and freedom are two completely different things. And the first step toward lawlessness is independence. All right. 
How do we start? Let's look at Psalm 92, verse 13. They're going to flash these up on the screen. These are in the New Living. Again, we don't have the Passion Translation uh, fully available to put on the screen, but this is really good as well. So New Living says, For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house, and they flourish in the courts of our God. They are transplanted to the Lord's own house, and they flourish in the courts of our God. One translation says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Those who are planted, trans, transplanted is a better word. So I want to tell you that there's a connection between you being designed to flourish and you being planted and or transplanted. And to wonder why you're not flourishing may have as much to, much to do with a root issue as it does with any other thing in your life. You may have pure motives but insufficient root system. And you get quiet. Well, you, tell, you mentioned the word spiritual authority. Everybody goes, <laughs> you want this revelation, but you don't want to follow the pattern. There's a reason why certain people hear other things and other people do not. It's not luck. It's not the lottery. It's called order and honor. And if we're not going to walk the ways of order and honor, I don't care how gifted you are. You'll be nothing more than a bottle rocket. And God knows I've sat and watched many bottle rockets take off in my 50 years. All right, now let's look at Genesis 2, 8. This is one of my favorite ones out of the New Living. Genesis 2, chapter 8 says, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. He planted a garden. The Passion Translation, let me read it to you out of the Passion Translation, also out of Genesis chapter 2. This is verse 8 as well. Then Yahweh God planted a lush garden paradise in the east, in the land of delight, and there he placed the man he had formed. Listen to that again. Yahweh God planted a lush garden paradise in the east, in the land of delight, and there he placed a man he had formed. Why would a God who can create anything in a fully mature state want to plant anything in seed form? The same reason you don't want your children born as adults. He loves the process. And we seem to be a society and culture of people that want to see how fast we can get it done, how quick we can get to the finish line, how fast we can fill up the building, how fast we can become famous, how fast we can make the money, how fast we can impact the culture. And we miss that Yahweh planted a garden eastward in Eden. I'm going to read this to you again one more time out of the Passion, and we'll go to Genesis. No, we'll actually go to Revelation 2 and then Genesis 4. Then Yahweh God planted a lush garden paradise in the east, in the land of delight, and there he placed the man he had formed. <laughs> Let's look at Revelation 22, 2. Now, this word here where it says Yahweh planted is nada. It's a Hebrew word that means to plant, to fasten, to fix, to root, or to establish. So look at it again. It's an important word for where we're going tonight. Nada means to plant, fasten, fix, root, or establish. Let's look at Revelation 22, verse 2. The river was flowing in the middle of the streets of the city. On either side of the river was the tree of life with 12 kinds of ripe fruit according to each month of the year. The leaves of the trees of life are for the healing of the nations. Now let's begin to think of that in terms of an under the oaks gathering because we're going to ultimately go to beginning to understand what those trees are representative of. And those trees are representative of this, planted people who in another season needed beauty for their ashes, gladness for mourning. They needed the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And they go through this process in Isaiah 61 of transformation. They become the oaks of righteousness. Listen to this. The planting of the Lord. 
and the ones who are planted by the Lord, leaves are able to be used for the healing of the nations. Many have great gifts, but are under the scourge of rootlessness. And because you have no root system, because you have no connection to something bigger than yourself, then you don't have the ability to move into the place where you reach the maturation state that your leaves are able to do what your leaves were ultimately designed to do, which was to do more than bring covering. They're meant to bring healing. And religion will teach you how to get covered, but it'll give you no ability to understand how to be rooted. And I would like to do away with the language that you need a spiritual covering. The only spiritual covering in the Bible is a husband over his wife. There is no, listen to me, there is no prerequisite in scripture for you having a covering over your ministry. It's a cop out because you're unwilling to surrender to fatherhood. People come to me all the time, email me all the time. Well, I'd like for you to be a covering for my ministry. You don't know me and I don't know you and I'm not looking to cover you. That to me immediately says you got something to hide. Sound more like a cover up than a cover over. But what the father is doing is the father is moving people away from denominational religious systems where people gather around doctrines they agree on, and he's now seating them around the table with fathers. And fathers are helping a group of people not just to move in the anointing and not just to move in the gifts, but to establish a root system where generations from now, other generations will be able to sit in the shade of the covenant that you made with God because you allowed yourself to be planted by a river of living water. Say planted. And I really believe if you'll listen to me, if you won't get mad at me too quick tonight, I'm helping you get to the more you've cried out for and said, why hadn't it happened yet? Why hadn't it happened yet? Because the father loves you too much to give you the weight of what you want when you don't have the root system to hold it. And the root system's not your anointing and the root system's not your promise. (laughs) The most significant Trees that we have in America are the redwoods. And the redwoods are gigantic. I've driven my truck through one of them. Massive. How many of you ever seen the redwoods out in California? Massive redwood trees. Interestingly, redwood trees don't have deep roots. They have deeply entwined roots. And rather than one individual, I'm going to talk now, rather than one individual tree going real deep by itself, it chose to spread out and get its roots entwined with the tree next to it that got their roots entwined, trying with it, sound like tethered, and got their roots entwined next to them and their roots entwined with the one next to them. And then all of a sudden you and I have a strength because of the power of our connection that starts to make Yahweh's math make sense of one can put a thousand to flight, but two ten thousand. I know a lot of people who have in their mind gone real deep in God and their leaves aren't bringing healing to anybody. I'm going to repeat that. I know a lot of people who believe they've personally gone real deep in God all by themselves and their roots aren't bringing healing. Their leaves aren't bringing healing to anybody because the root system is significant if you and I are going to be the planting of the Lord whose leaves bring forth healing to the nations. I don't believe you were designed to do this by yourself. God did not say it's not good for Adam to be alone. He wasn't alone. He was with the Father, Son, and the Spirit. He was in the best company anybody had ever had in the history of, would ever have in the history of the world to come. He didn't say it's not good for Adam to be alone. He said it's not good for Adam to be all one. See, Adam's issue was he could procreate independently. He had a womb in him. That's where Yahweh went to get it from. Womb man, come on now, womb man was in Adam. So Yahweh didn't have to make something Adam didn't have. He had to go in and get something Adam didn't need to have by himself. 
And so he said, it's not good for Adam to be all, all one because if you can procreate independently, then you don't have the need to depend on somebody else and therefore you'll get overconfident in your own strength because you start to feel like you can do this by yourself. Yahweh said, I'm going to pull that out of you and I'm going to give you a helpmate and I'm going to make her so beautiful that you fall in love with another because that's what perfect love looks like in the perichoresis circle dance where the father is fascinated with the son and the son is fascinated with the spirit who's fascinated with the father. Adam wasn't alone, but Adam was all one and he went and took the womb man out of the man so that the man would need another to love in order to reproduce. Many have great giftings, but they're not highly reproductive because they don't have a connection to another. Oh, good word, brother. Genesis chapter four. Mm-hmm. Well, well, well. Genesis chapter four, starting in verse nine. I'm going to put it in the New Living Translation up on the screen. I used to do that. Y'all don't know. There's some videos out there. All right. Genesis chapter four, verse nine. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know. Cain responded. Am I my brother's gardener? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. What is the curse of Cain? Homeless wanderer. The first murder of a brother in envy over another brother resulted in the curse of the loss of home. And oftentimes, it's still envy that keeps us from being planted. It's still jockeying for position and tried to outshine another that keeps us from being a part of family the way that we were designed to. Oh, I feel some things stirring in my heart. Two Hebrew words are used here in verse 12. If you'll keep that on the screen for me. Who I got back there? Casey. Casey. Okay, Casey. Casey from Texas. Single thirsty. Looking for a man, looking for a man. She looking for a man. She'd been looking for a man when she was in Texas. She'd be looking for a man in Alabama. So just saying. We'll take bids right now if y'all want. <laughs> what do you want to get for All right, verse 12. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you no matter how hard you work. From now on, you'll be a homeless wanderer in the earth. Two Hebrew words are used here in verse 12. First is the word that most translations, including the Passion Translation, translate as fugitive. So let's just read it in the Passion real quickly. Read it in the Passion. Genesis chapter 4. And let's look at verse 12 here. Man, this is so good. I'm going to read verse 11 too. Now you are banished from the land, from the very ground that drank your brother's blood from your hand. When you try to cultivate the ground, it will no longer produce crops for you and you will be a fugitive and a homeless wanderer. You'll be a fugitive and a homeless wanderer. I want to look at this word real quick. Nua is the word that is translated in most translations fugitive and it means to quiver, to wander, to waver, or totter, to stagger. Fugitive is a really poor translation. Whatever translate this, they, it's a poor translation in the Passion. It's a poor translation in a lot of other translations. The fugitive just doesn't work. It means Noah. It means to quiver, to wander, to waver, to totter, to stagger. All right. Second is the word that both, both the New Living and the Passion translation translate as homeless wanderer. The King James version translates it as vagabond, and it's the Hebrew word nude. And nude means to shake, to waver, to wander, to move to and fro, listen to this, to often take flight, to wander aimlessly, to shake, to waver, 
to wander, to move to and fro, to often take flight, to wander aimlessly. Look at the outcome of Cain's transgression. Listen to this. The earth will no longer cooperate with you no matter how hard you try. And you will be a homeless wanderer. When you and I are operating under the orphan spirit, oftentimes we end up rejecting the invitation into family that could actually bring us into our most stable place of having been rooted. A lack of feeling accepted causes us at times to murder our brother and lose our sense of home. Many people who even crave to be connected have been so processed through rejection that even when you try to reach and help, they'll go ahead and prematurely reject you in order to not build up their hopes that you're going to actually be the one that sticks around. And you can almost get to where as a leader, you discern that in people to say, you're going to keep me at arm's length because you have already predetermined that this is going to end in rejection. So the first thing that has to come to you is not finding your way home. The first thing that comes to you is the revelation of how deeply and dearly you love you, loved you are by the Father. Therefore, joining yourself to family is not where you're looking to find out that you're loved. Joining yourself to family is where you get rooted in what you've found out about what it means to be loved. And where your being loved gets rooted with my being loved and our roots get intertwined and you and I together begin to create a forest of shade for a people who are dying from the oppressive heat of religion. And all of a sudden people begin to go, there's water here, there's shade here, there's hope here, there's help here. And people don't even understand why are people transitioning? Why is it that people are moving around? Because a handful of people begin to hear the revelation of beloved righteousness. And inside of that, they let them hit, that hit them deeply enough that to get joined to another no longer felt like a risk. Because even if later you decide you don't want me, I'm so convinced he does. That to risk giving myself to you doesn't feel like much of a risk anymore because I know how deeply he is holding me in the palm of his hand. Therefore, I can. There was a season where I wrestled with how my propensity toward privacy may be a fear of rejection. Like, do I gravitate toward privacy because you let people in ultimately people let you down but I have come to discover my propensity for privacy is trust in not needing to cater to people in order to get them to stick around I processed this for a long time but my having a my propensity for privacy is to understand that I don't feel like I have to make you feel like you're wanted and belong and you belong because if I ever start down that path I'm gonna have to keep people in that position where they're constantly being made to feel like you're loved and you're accepted you belong and I believe that's supposed to come from Abba and I believe Abba is jealous to give it to you and I believe if I give you something he wants to give you I can find myself in a bad spot Come on, we're going to hear some things tonight. Then along the line, in the process, God will bring people into your life. And those people come into your life. And rather than ultimately at the end of the day rejecting you, they're actually used as agents of the hand of God to bring healing to you. Because for every person that dishonored, for every person that rejected, for every person that betrayed, for every person that rose up against you, it doesn't matter how many there were, one real son who really looks at you with a heart of honor can begin to bring radiant healing into your heart in so many ways that you begin to find yourself going, you know what, I'd go through all of that all over again if I could find that one who really does honor well. This hit me so strong tonight, I was already planning on talking about this, and then maybe, the, maybe, maybe boy, this one's going to be tough to talk about, but maybe the man has been the most honorable to me in my life. I, didn't, I had no idea Lyndon was going to be here tonight. But when he hugged me tonight, a 
those arms have been around me in the most challenging, difficult times of my life, and they've always been there, and they're always present, and here he shows up tonight. And I'm saying to you, this is what I'm saying to you. I'm saying to you, for every Lyndon, you may have a hundred Absaloms. Come on, leaders, let me talk to you. Let's don't, let's don't play like this is not real. For every one of him, you may have a hundred Absaloms, but it doesn't take but one real son to deal with the wounds from every bastard son that just wanted to use you for something they could get out of you. So I want to tell you, get so secure in your beloved identity that you're able to open up your arms and take the risk of letting people in and saying, I know it's difficult when people leave. I know it's difficult when people wound. I know it's difficult when people reject. But at the end of the day, Abba has me so secure that he is watching over his word to perform it in my life that I'm able to open my heart deeply enough to relationship and connect the way the father has designed me to. Now, I know a lot of y'all want me to start talking theology, don't you? See, this is what people want. I want to tickle me in my ears with the intellectual stuff. No, no. I'm going to try to help you for this not to be some Johnny come lately message that you've heard that you listen to some podcast on and b- become fanboy. We're not doing that here. We're going to allow people to get rooted in the family and connected to what the Lord's doing so that this revelation 100 years from now is having its intended impact on the cosmos. All right? So let's go a little further. Are you ready? You with me? Two Hebrew words that are used. The first is nuah. The second is nude. And both of them in some sense mean to waver. The second nude specifically means to move to and fro, to often take flight, to wander aimlessly. So this is the outcome of Cain's transgression against Abel. The earth will no longer cooperate with you no matter how hard you try, and you will be a homeless wanderer. Let's look at Acts 19, 13 through 16. I'm gonna go into some new stuff. A little bit of this may be review for some of you, but for most of you, it's probably not. Acts 19, verse 13. Now there were seven itinerant Jewish exorcists, sons of Sceva, the high priest, who took it upon themselves to use the name and authority of Jesus over those who were demonized. They would say, we cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. (laughs) One day when they said those words, the demon and the man replied, I know about Jesus and I recognize Paul, but who do you think you are? Then the demonized man jumped on them, threw them to the ground, beating them mercilessly. He overpowered the seven exorcists until they all ran out of the house naked and badly bruised. What's significant about this? Dr. Simmons uses the word itinerant. Can we go back to verse 13? Seven itinerant Jewish exorcists. Yeah. The words sound familiar? How sexy it is to be an itinerant. I was a sexy itinerant. That's when you say, yes, you were. My God, you still are. I can... Itinerant. What do we want to do? The fun stuff. I don't do the rooting stuff. I don't do the establishing stuff. I don't do the day-to-day stuff. I don't do the fun stuff. I want to come into town. This is what we say, come into town, blow in, blow up, and blow out. Itinerant ministers. Let's look at what the word actually means in the Greek. Let's look at what this word actually means in the Greek. It's really interesting. Periorkoma is the word, and it means to wander about. It means to vacillate. It means to stroll about making a circuit. Help me, somebody. To stroll about (laughs) making a circuit for Mark, Jimmy. He buried your past, and I'm not going back. I'm not making a bed in my shame. (laughs) 
And I had people, let, let me use Mark as an example, Jimmy as an example, Bobby wasn't able to be here. Um, and let me use these guys as an example and tell you about how much time they wasted. <laughs> Selling circuit rider t-shirts. Yeah, going into churches and having meetings. And how many people were offended at me when I took them off that battlefield and helped them become fathers. But how much different the world will look 100, 200, 300, and 400 years from now because those itinerant wanderers said, we're going to stop making the circuit and we're going to allow ourselves to be joined to a father. And by way of being joined to a father, we're going to establish a root system. And by the way, the establishment of that root system, we're going to see the kingdom do more than have an incredible few days. We're going to see the kingdom move from one generation to another generation to another generation. And if you go back and you look at the etymology of these words, it's very interesting because the word that we find translated in Genesis for homeless wanderer is the, has an ideological link, listen to this, to the Greek word that we find over in Acts when it talks about them being vagabond Jews. In essence, they were trying to operate in authority that was illegal for them to operate in if they had no root system. They had a covenant, but they had no root system. And, and listen, it was not just followers of Jesus that were able to cast out demons. We know that there were exorcists that were successful in exorcism based on exercising the covenant of Yahweh that was established through Abraham. So they don't get their brains beat in because they're trying to cast out a demon. They get their brains beat in because they're trying to cast out a demon while not having a home. And so what the father is trying to say to us, listen, 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 I know this is not what people want to hear. Let's go start talking about some theosis and some kenosis and some, this has been transformative to my life for 40 years. I walked with well, 38 years since he became a spiritual father in my life. And he didn't become a spiritual father in my life because, uh, because I was just moved by his revelation into his podcast. There was no such a thing. But I remember going to the orange Julius. Y'all know nothing about the orange Julius to you young. The Orange Julius at the Eastdale Mall in Montgomery, Alabama, a three-speed on the column, old blue Ford pickup truck, and right down there, and I remember at that point in time going, there's something right there that if I can tether myself to this, and then one of the most difficult days of my life, the day he told me he was moving to Panama City, he was leaving Millbrook, Alabama to go to Panama City, he was going to Panama City because he knew he had to go get joined to an apostle. I didn't know what that was. All I knew is he was leaving me. And then when God called me to leave South Carolina, I had to call him and tell him, I'm sorry for how hard I thought that was for me. Because now that I'm the one leaving, I know it was a lot harder for you to leave sons behind than it was to be the one who was left. How difficult, how challenging that is. But I understood that if I could allow myself, I don't know how, except the goodness of God, the Holy Spirit, and having an un incredible biological father natural dad who never ever tried to hoard my relationship with him. He wanted me to have this connection to this man. He, he moved that man to Panama City with that word even though he didn't want to see him go any more than I did. And I can remember taking a Greyhound bus from Montgomery to Panama City and sleeping on his couch. Remember being Jeff Culp, getting on a Greyhound bus, stopped 19 times between Montgomery and Panama City so people could smoke and get off and, and do whatever people on Greyhound buses do. But I was determined even at then that I was going to be tethered. And as soon as I got out of high school, my mom and dad drove me to Mobile, Alabama. And I got an apartment and I moved and I, I vacillated, moved away. Never wanted to get disconnected from him, but vacillated with what I wanted my life to look like. And when I stand here today and tell you that I'm living a dream, I am not just living a dream that came because God had a call upon my life when I was a young man. I'm living a dream because of an honor toward a man that I said I'm going to remain tethered to that man and 
And not only is this thing's not going to be about my dreams, it's going to be about our dreams. And we're going to find ourselves on the same piece of ground, dreaming together and seeing the kingdom of God not just be impacted because I'm making the circuit, but be impacted because we've established a root system and now multiple generations are going to find their roots entwined with what the Lord's been establishing in this. I had reasons from time to time that if I wanted to justify being untethered, I could have. And he had mo reasons. <laughs> That's Greek, mo reasons. That if he wanted to disconnect himself from me, he could have, but two men chose to be men and to remain tethered. And by way of that decision, we now find ourselves in the middle of something unfolding. I don't believe eye has seen, and I don't believe ear has heard, and I don't believe we're doing anything but getting started. And I think it would be error for me to get up here and talk to you about the revelation and not tell you about the root system. I ought to be honest with you. I think I'd be robbing from you to get up here and share with you about the revelation, not talk to you about the root system. I'm married to that woman because of that man. Because that woman wasn't in the town I grew up in. That woman was in the town Yahweh sent him to. If I don't do anything but spend the rest of my life thanking him for helping me end up with her, it would, be too, it would not be too much. Thank you, Lord. I want you to remember the demoniac in Gadara. Matthew 8 Mark 5 and Luke 8. This is what the Bible says concerning him. He had no clothes, neither did he abode, have an abode of a home. So he had no home, he had no clothes, both two things that should have been provided by a father. Understanding in this culture, garments were a point of identification. Think Joseph in his coat of many colors. Think Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus who took off his loose upper garment communicating that he was a beggar because he did not have a father that was able to embrace him in his lack of vision. Hello. And so when we look at the demoniac, we recognize that his issue was a fatherlessness issue. And whatever the outworking of that was, naked, living in a graveyard, cutting himself with rocks, or another preacher looking at pornography. I figured that would get pretty quiet. (laughs) You might want me to look at your preaching notes, but there's very few of you that want me to go through your phone. Let's talk. And if that father is not in my life to clap over my preaching notes, I hope he does clap over my preaching notes, but he's here to know what's going on in my guts. And when he sees something going on in here that's not right here or not right here, he is in my life not to just say attaboy, even though that's what most of it looks like today. Oh, but there was a day when it wasn't a lot about attaboy. It was about pow down, J.K. Scott style, pow, kick him. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the correction. I'm thankful for the care. I'm thankful for him being willing to run me off by being willing to tell me the truth because it was in that that I was able to to become a man. Not the man of God, become a man. And in becoming a man, I'm able to reproduce. And now we're able to move into the joy of understanding and starting to get the revelation of what it means to actually be rooted. The affliction of wandering and the grace for coming home. Let's look at John 15. Thank you, Holy Ghost. John 15, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, says, I am a true sprouting vine, and the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. Stop right there. Verse 2. He cares for the branches connected to be my lifting and propping up the fruitless branches. That's not what my old Bible said. My old Bible said he removes the fruitless branches and discards them. This one says he takes up the fruitless branches and brings them to himself. He doesn't remove the branches according to Dr. Simmons' footnote. He takes them to himself as the wise and loving farmer. He lifts them up off the ground to enhance their growth. 
And you and I were so trained in legalistic religion that we believed that if the Father found us without fruit, it meant rejection. And this tells me when the Father finds you without fruit, it means extra attention. Which starts to feel like the opposite of rejection. And if he doesn't do rejection, maybe I don't have to spend the rest of my life fearing it. Because every fear of you rejecting me, I project onto you, starts with a fear of believing he has the ability to reject me. And he does not do rejection or abandonment. And if he doesn't, I'm safe regardless of how you treat me. Because I give him the liberty to be my chief source from which I find satisfaction, from which I find identity, from which I find wholeness and sustenance. And so therefore, I'm able to move into relationships in such a healthy place that I'm not looking for you to fulfill something in me. And I'm not looking to be somebody else's fulfillment. I'm just looking to help you get rooted. I just want to help you not be so moved by the wind. And I don't want you to go through another fruitless season followed by a fruitless season followed by a fruitless season. And who really cares? Because you're just something that can be thrown away at any point in time anyway. No, you are of immense, extreme value. And the Father has brought you into this place so he could pull you to himself. And so you know what? You're going to make it. I, I don't know where you came from, how far you traveled, or what you've been through, but I felt like God said, I want you to give them a message of fathering tonight, and I want you to tell them, you could, you could talk a lot about the theological stuff, and I love that, but I heard the Father say, I want you to tell them there is a family that has thrown the doors wide open to them, and is welcoming them to come away from the orphan spirit, and the sense of being isolated and alone, and vulnerable, and subject to rejection, and be able to find there is a place here where we have now a generational witness of what it means for people to choose by God to walk together and have relationship so that you would be able to come into a place that has a sense of health and generational consciousness. John 15, we're going to read a little bit further. He props up the fruitless branches. Again, we're in verse two. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. The words that I have spoken over you have already cleansed you, so you must remain in life union with me, for I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. So you understand your life source is not connection to a father. Your life source is connection to Jesus and fathers are present to make sure you stay there. My role in this house is I am, I'm the minnow guy. Minnow is the word abide that's used over and over again in John's gospel. Abide. I am here to help people keep the one thing, the one thing. I mean, if I, if I boiled down every message, I only have one. One is get fascinated with the eyes of Jesus. And it has a thousand different tentacles, but it's one message. It's been one message for a long, long time, and it's going to remain one message for the rest of my life. And if we can keep the first thing the first thing, then you recognize, I'm not saying get a spiritual father in your life so you'll be fulfilled. I'm not saying get a spiritual father in your life so that you'll be fruitful. I'm saying get a spiritual father in your life so you'll quit wandering aimlessly and having seasons of incredible fruit and seasons of absolutely no fruit. It's it's not normal for a kingdom man to live subject to seasons. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, Psalm 1, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. Say planted. Planted, planted by rivers of living water that brings forth fruit in every season. Not its season. It's a bad translation. Brings forth fruit in every season. The reason we know it's every season is because the leaf never withers. Therefore, there is no fall and there is no winter. The leaf never withers. The fruit is in every season. He'll be like a tree planted by rivers of living water that brings forth fruit in every season. Whatsoever he does will prosper. Think about this. You and I coming to a place where we don't just 
hear a message, but coming into a place where we're given permission to be established in the message, to let the root system go as deep as it needs to go and to get as entwined as it was designed to get entwined. For what cause? Because this is what you really want. And it's honestly the only way for you to get to more. I'm not the vine or the branches. I'm not the vine dresser. But I'm walking through the vineyard with you, saying you're gonna make it. I'm walking through the vineyard with you and saying if we can cut that out right there, I know it's not gonna feel good in the moment, but if we can cut that out right there, you're gonna be who you've cried out to become. And if you don't want that in your life, I wonder why. Well, y'all are quiet. Thank you, Lord. He doesn't just create, he plants. He tends as a compassionate farmer. He doesn't cast away, but he pulls close. For us to understand this, we're going to have to escape a legalistic framework. That performance generates proximity. Performance does not generate proximity. And proximity doesn't generate performance. Proximity changes identity, and identity is what determines performance. So the first thing that you and I are going to have to do is to come into a measure of nearness, a measure of face-to-face, -face, and then listen. What it would be like to live in a culture where the encounter that we had tonight that we were given permission to go you know, you know, an hour and a half into it was amazing, but I don't like it as much as what happens in here on a Tuesday morning prayer meeting. It was amazing. And I would say the people who made the expression don't like it as much as what happens in here in a Tuesday morning prayer meeting. And I actually like my Monday morning prayer meeting when there's four of us in here better than the Tuesday morning prayer meeting when there's 250 of us in here. Why? Because this is us being invited into a lifestyle, not us just taking a message, having an encounter and doing some amazing meetings over a few days. And I really feel like there's a group of people that are in here and the on, only way that I ever would have felt like the Lord direct me to do this type of teaching coming into this. And stick around for Thursday and Friday and we're going to talk a lot about the cosmos. We're going to talk a lot about the new heavens and the new earth and the theosis. It's all good. Not, not, nothing wrong with any of that. But I feel like to jump towards that for people who have not yet allowed themselves to find their way into family is setting them up for great disappointment in the days to come. <laughs> a little bit further. I'm not going to keep you here all night, I promise. I said earlier, why would a God with the ability to create anything already fully mature want to plant something in seed form? For the same reason that you didn't want your babies to be born fully mature adults. A random God wants you to quit screwing up and to have it all figured out by now. But our Abba is not a random God. He's a father. Everyone wants to be powerfully anointed and gloriously used, but I have found that few are willing to actually be planted. I'm coming to understand that not only is he committed to our process of maturation, but that he actually enjoys it. After all, he designed it that way. And rather than you feeling like God is mostly disappointed with you because you should be further along by now, why don't you celebrate that God is fascinated with your unwillingness to walk away even if you're frustrated with your own development? That's good, huh? What if our idealized version of ourselves is actually nothing more than an idol that we created on our own? What if Superman you was your idea? And child filled with wonder is what he wanted for you all along. <laughs> what if our idealized version of ourselves is an idol that we tried to create on our own? And then what if the you that Abba wants to mold is supposed to be raw? Tender, yet unformed, but perfectly surrendered to the potter's care, his hands. I'm going to read that again. I want us to get this. This is important. 
What if our idealized version of ourselves is an idol that we're trying to create on our own? And then what if the you that Abba wants to mold is supposed to be raw, tender, yet unformed, but perfectly surrendered to the potter's care in hands? I see people clamoring about trying to get God to bless the image that they long to project. And the reason why you and I are gloriously invited back into this place of tenderness is so we can find our way back on the wheel. Because if we can find our way back on the wheel, there's a measure of trust in us that says, whatever this process looks like, I am convinced that every bit of the pressure and spinning I'm feeling right now is for my good. Because he is committed to making me into a vessel of honor that is meet for the master's use. And so whatever process I need to surrender to, there's a yes in my heart to that surrender. I think there's this thing in leaders that was saying, you know what, I'm a big boy now and I'm ready for God to bless me. And he said, I'm not going to bless you until you come back to the you I can do something with. The childlike one filled with wonder, awestruck, astonished in our heart by the greatness of the God who has chosen to include us in his dance with the Father, Son, and Spirit. We're in such a hellfire hurry to get grown up. And I am about to turn 50, and I'm just now finding my way back into childlikeness. Finally maturing into the one he can actually take by the hand and lead into the dimensions I would be scared to go into as an adult by myself, but I'm happy to go into with a father holding my hand. Let's look at Exodus 15, 17. Show you a couple more of these verses and then we're going to move on. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, reserved for your own dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. Look at it again. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. How'd you get here? And many will allow themselves to be brought in and then not allow themselves to be planted. Genesis 9.20 said, Noah plants a vineyard. He, he then went a little far with the enjoying the vineyard, had a naked, mo- you know, the whole, listen, he'd been on a boat with his family. <laughs> Give the man a break. He needs something to drink. He'd been on a boat with his family and a bunch of crazy animals. And I don't think it's the animals driving him crazy. He'd been on the boat with his family. All right. Genesis 21, 33 says, Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba. Let's look at Numbers 24. I just want to show you this planting principle throughout Scripture. Numbers 24, beginning in verse 3. Did I give you guys this one? Yes, I did. And this is the message he delivered. This is the message of Balaam, son of Beor, the message of the man whose eyes see clearly. I love this. Verse 4, the message of the one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who bows down with eyes wide open. Verse 25, how beautiful are the tents of Jacob. How lovely are your homes, O Israel. Give me one more verse. Actually, we'll do two more. Verse 6, they spread before me like palm groves, like gardens by the riverside. They are like tall trees planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Verse 27, water will flow from their buckets. Their offspring have all they need. Their king will be greater than Agag, and their kingdom will be exalted. Who are these? The ones who are planted. Your planting affects the next generation. Look at it again. Back up and look at verse 6, please. Thank you. Walk, look, verse 6, there you go. They spread before me like prom groves, like gardens by the riverside. They are like tall trees planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Verse 7, water will flow from their buckets. Their offspring will have all they need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You being planted is a big deal. 
Go a little bit further. I'm going to take it as far as I feel like the Lord tells me to, and then we'll make a shift. Let's look at 2 Samuel 7.10. And I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past. Now look at, look at this again. I'll provide a homeland. We call this the homestead. For my people Israel, planting them in a, secure cla- in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. So again, what we find Yahweh doing for his people, planting them. From Genesis. Now we're all the way in 2 Samuel. We've used references all throughout the Old Testament of this concept of planting. In, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Paul calls himself a planter and Apollos a waterer. I planted you and Apollos watered you. So understand that part of what the apostolic does is not just give you a message that's moving your heart and give you a message that's stimulating your mind, but what the apostolic does is help you to get both planted and watered so that the stuff that you're hearing does more than affect you. It actually begins to cause fruit to stream from within you so that we can begin to see this message not just impact the handful of people in this room, but for it to begin to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And I think a big, huge piece of that is us swinging the doors to this place open on a week like this and saying, we're inviting people to be a part of the family tree. Maybe you already have that type of connection and you have that type of home and stuff. That's awesome. I would never want to do anything to violate that in any way. But I am saying to the people who are hearing what the Lord's doing and saying, how do I get more joined to what the Lord is doing? I'm saying to you, those doors are wide open. For this to become either a home for you or a home away from home for you so that you can begin to allow yourself to move into a culture whereby we have a generational witness of what it looks like for people to be planted and established. A generational witness of what it means for people to be planted and established. All right, I'm going to give you... All right, let's do Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, and then I'll move into this a uh, little bit of New Testament stuff here. We'll shift it around. Jeremiah 7, 17. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. Verse 8. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Do more than find a place water's flowing. Get planted there. Why are the leaves in Psalms 1 not subject to seasons? And why are these leaves not subject to drought? Because they've learned to drink from what's flowing instead of what's falling. Remember manna. Manna fell and God designed them to get sick of what fell on them. And the only thing we've known to say of a move of God is he's sending it on down and it's falling down and the glory's coming down. But they were designed for a land that flowed with milk and honey and he designed them to get sick of having to hope something falls in the morning when they could live with a land where they had the responsibility to steward a place where what they longed for actually flowed towards them. So you and I getting planted means we are no longer subject to living and dying based on what is or is not falling. We've learned to drink from what's flowing, which means you're going to have to get beyond the surface and you're going to have to begin to develop a root system that gives you the ability to receive sustenance regardless of what's going on around you atmospherically. All right? A little bit further. A little bit further. I'm, I'm, you can do this. You're leaders. We are not just being invited to find a river of renewal, but rather to receive grace to be planted there. Find your family and get planted and get watered by apostolic leadership, Paul and Apollos. The principal purpose of spiritual authority is not, now this this will challenge even what my apostle's spiritual father mostly believed about spiritual fathers, but I'm okay to do that. I want you to hear this. The principal purpose of spiritual authority is not to deliver you from lawlessness, but rather to set you free from misidentification. If we do not come to see, this is important, man. If we do not come to see the core of all that constitutes our identity as those that are beloved of the Father in perfect righteousness, we will wander aimlessly looking for production to identify us rather than sonship. 
Lawlessness is the offspring of the orphan spirit. And to try to correct someone's behavior and make them obey the laws when someone doesn't know who they are in an identificational sense is to create futility in the heart of the individual who may sincerely want to know better, may want to sincerely want to do better, but they have no idea who they are. And therefore their behavior is manifesting the witness of how rotten they feel on the inside. And what fathers do is say, that's not who you are. Even while you're still doing it, that's not who you are. And they begin to call you out of that so you can be rooted and established in your identity. And from that place of being rooted and established in your identity, all of a sudden the outworking of the fruit you've longed for all of your life begins to come quite naturally, not by way of self-effort. All right, a little bit further. Keep saying that. I'm, gonna get, I'm, gonna get, I'm getting somewhere. Matthew 13, 3 through 6. He taught them many things by using stories and parables that would illustrate spiritual truth, saying, consider this, there was a farmer who went out to sow seeds. As he cast his seeds, some fell along the barren path and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on the gravel that had no topsoil. The seeds quickly shot up, verse six. When the days grew hot, the sprouts were scorched and withered because they had insufficient Roots. Here we go. Root is the word ridza. Ridza is actually that which is like a root, but is a metaphor for offspring or progeny. Root is a family word. They had no ridza. They had no connection. They had nothing to sustain them when it got hot. Hallelujah. I feel this. I feel this. I feel this. That, let's look at the definition of Fritz again. Fritz of the Greek word, which is like a root, but it's a metaphor for offspring or progeny. It's a family word. One of the Hebraic idioms for the devotional life is, is a fig tree. When Jesus says to Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree, he's probably saying a lot more than I know which tree you were sitting under. He's saying, I have looked into your devotional world. When Zacchaeus climbed a tree, he didn't climb a sycamore tree. He climbed a sycamore fig tree, which again was a picture of him trying to climb into devotional ascent. So let's look at this a little bit. I, I, have, I have used a, a, for years now the fig tree as a Hebraic uh, idiom for the devotional life. And I have learned that a fig tree bears fruit in its first year. But the farmer comes and pinches the buds of the fig tree in year one and in year two until he knows the fig tree has a significant enough infrastructure to hold the weight of the fruit. The fig tree can make a fig in year one, and the fig tree can make a fig in year two. But if the fig tree doesn't have a vine dresser that's willing to come and pinch the buds, the fruit will actually be destructive to the infrastructure of the fig tree. You can make a baby at 12. It doesn't mean it's a good idea. And because you physically can doesn't mean you're ready yet. Jesus is astounding everybody in the temple at 12. He's answering their questions. He starts asking them questions and then the dialogue goes so far that now they're asking him questions and he's answering their questions and they are astounded by what's on his life. And Mary and Joseph are walking home and they get a couple of days down the road. (laughs) So there's a little, you know, I don't understand. I don't know. You ain't got but one kid. I mean, maybe the brothers, maybe there's a brother or two around by them, but still, it ain't like you had that many. You should know if one was gone. Yeah. 
they lost God. But I think here's the picture. The picture is they've been at this feast. They've been at this festival and everybody's having a good time. And now they're going home. And I think it's a picture of what happens in the church. We start enjoying the festival and don't even realize we lost Jesus. We got incredible music and nobody knows they lost Jesus. We got a thousand people here and nobody knows they lost Jesus. We got 14 campuses and nobody knows that we lost Jesus. We got LED screens and multi-million dollar facilities and nobody knows that we lost Jesus. And so what do you do? You keep the band playing, you keep the dancing going, and you try to forget that there is no Jesus in the middle of what it is that we're doing. So they go back, they find Yeshua. Yeshua is in the temple, mesmerizing the priest, mesmerizing the scribes, answering their questions, asking them questions. And then, and then Mary is like, well, where, where, where have you been? I, I was a smart little kid. So I would have said, you left me. It ain't my job to stay with you. It's your job not to leave me. Especially if I was God. I'd have played that card on mama all the time. You clean the room. I'm God. <laughs> take out the trash. God, don't take out no trash. <laughs> Son, you talking about girlfriends. If you could throw the God card down, I'd have been, see why I wasn't picked? <laughs> and here he is. About to birth fruit he doesn't have the infrastructure for. And they take him home. And we don't hear from him for 18 years. He's mesmerizing at 12. But he doesn't have the infrastructure to hold that fruit. So do you know who he goes home with? Mary and Joseph. If Jesus needed another father. If Jesus needed a Joseph, you might need more than just Abba. Hello now. Why would Jesus need Joseph? Because the one thing the father did not know. I'm going to step on some toes here, but I got to teach you this. The one thing the father didn't know how to help Jesus do was resist temptation because he can't be tempted with evil. The Bible said God cannot be tempted with evil, evil, neither tempts he any man. The one thing God knew nothing about was resisting temptation because he'd never had to face it. But Joseph had to live married to a woman in the same house he couldn't touch till after she had the baby. So I want to testify that Joseph was a master at resisting temptation. I want to testify that Joseph was such, come on now. I want to testify that Joseph was a man of such extreme integrity that the father knew right the house to put. Yes, he needed to know stuff about carpentry. Yes, he needed to know stuff about plumb lines. Yes, he needed to know stuff about framework. Yes, he he was going to teach on foundations. He was going to teach on don't build on the sand and build on the rock. He was going to talk. He was going to be called a wise master builder. Yes, he needed to know stuff stuff about carpentry, but I believe he needed to know more than stuff about carpentry. I believe he needed to know what it looked like for a man to honor a woman the way that his father Joseph would honor his mother Mary. I think he needed to be able to sit with Joseph and Joseph tell him, son, I know what it's like in the middle of the night to know that woman's laying in there and she's my wife. But I'm not going to touch her. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to touch her until the Father says it's right. And I believe that gave, come on, I'm, t- I'm having to look into this by the Spirit a little bit, but I believe that I'm seeing his willingness to allow Joseph to teach him how to operate in the law of restraint and how to say now's not the time and now's not the right time and I'm not going to produce premature fruit. I'll know when the time is right and when the time is ready. And so for 18 years, he sat on a measure of wisdom and knowledge that was a Astonishing. But I want to tell you, while he was sitting on that wisdom and that knowledge, it wasn't doing nothing. It was growing. It was increasing. It was intensifying. It was bearing fruit in his own heart and life because he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. He gets so satisfied to not be producing fruit that when the time comes for him to produce fruit, he doesn't know it's time, but his mama does. 
Thank God for mamas who know when it's time. And he, he didn't know when it was time, but his mama did. And, and, he, and she said, they've run out of wine. And he said, why are you telling me this? My time has not yet come. So at 12, he thinks it's time. And at 30, he doesn't think it's time. And both times he gets corrected by spiritual authority that God has sent in his life to tell him, no, not yet. And to tell him now, yes, absolutely. This is the time. I know it took a long time for me to get here, but we're here. That's not restriction, friend. That's permission. That's not somebody stopping you from doing what you want to do. That's somebody making sure you don't do something destructive by bearing fruit you don't yet have the infrastructure for. So you can get to the place where you just don't just thank God that he used you. I thank God for every time my buds got pinched. Thank God for the knock on my door at 5.30 in the morning. My apostle, I answered the door, living in Midtown Mobile, my boxer shorts. I thought, my God, what have I done now? I had PTSD over the phone ringing and knocking on the door. I know I was fixing to get in trouble. He said, I had a dream about you. And he said, and you always said, if you don't make some adjustments right now, you're going to become the very thing you hate. Generic. I'm praying for you. And left. The tenderness message hadn't happened yet. <laughs> right, Josh? No, no tenderness message. Somebody told me that they said, man, Papa is intense. I said, he's in the age of peace. You should have known the man before. If you think this is intense, mighty God. <laughs> this is the age of peace, Papa. Right? This is the age of peace, Papa. Intense? No, he's chill. Oh, thank you, Lord. And you know what in my mind? You know what my mind initially said? I'm on international television. I'm preaching in the biggest churches in America. I, I am famous. I am rich. And he's going to come tell me I'm headed down a path. Everybody wants to be on the path that I'm on. I went to the Bel Air Mall and walked around mad. It's unbelievable. God's given me favor. God's hand is upon my life. I'm anointed. <laughs> With the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him that as of my understanding I've been enlightened. God's given me this gift. I can preach this gift. And I've got all these doors are opening. And who opened the doors? The devil. <laughs> and pass by the footlocker and who's coming down the hallway? Papa. Can't get away from me. There he is, pass me. You doing, you doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing great. But I knew he had one motive. I knew in my heart he had one motive. He didn't care about TV cameras. He didn't care about the size of the churches. He didn't care about limousines and private airplanes. He cared about me. You better have somebody in your life that just flat dog cares about you. Doesn't care about what you can produce. Doesn't care about what you can do for them. Doesn't care about how you can help their cause. They just care about you. And if you never preached another word, you belong to me. If they don't want you, I do. I have built my financial world in such a way that the moment one of these boys, men, I should say, calls me and says, I want to come be with you. I'm not doing this anymore. They're paid for the rest of their lives. I'm not, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying let's don't call ourselves fathers and not build our lives in such a way that we can create a safe place for sons and daughters to be able to come and be established. And I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in their life because I think they're going to quit. There's something in you that makes you want to go for it when you know you got that kind of backing. It makes you want to say, well, if they do all leave me, I know somebody that's got my back. And if I can't pay the rent this month, I know somebody that's got my back. I'm not in this by myself. And I remember standing on the stage, and I'm not going to name names, but I stood on the stage, and I was, in, I was on, in the, on the largest Christian broadcasting network in the world at the time. And I'm standing on the stage, and I'm standing in the middle. You remember this. I'm standing between two of the most famous voices in Christianity, and they are handing a Bible, 
One guy is handing, you remember this, babe? One guy is handing a Bible to another guy and saying, I gave my mantle to you to change the nation. The other guy is taking the Bible and handing it to me and saying, I'm giving my mantle to you now that was given to me from him to change the nation. There are 17 million people watching this. And I'm like, I made it. I get a phone call. Getting on a Prevost bus to go to the next stop. That's not a Greyhound. <laughs> and I get a phone call, and this is what it says. I just want to know, who am I to you? From him. I was so mad. I was so mad. I mean, I made it. These are the prophecies and promises over my life. But if you don't have somebody in your life that can say, if you settle for that, you'll never get the more. And he knew. He, first of all, he knew I would not have made it had I stayed an actor on that stage. I was going to have to come to myself. And I, I, I just felt like when I, ha when I had him pray, I felt like my apple cart got turned upside down today. And the father said, if you, if you let people being impacted in this message come and just be impacted by the message and not understand the root system. I didn't live in Mobile, Alabama because I didn't like South Carolina. I don't live in Mobile, Alabama because I didn't like South Carolina. And I'm here, this is what I think I'm saying. I don't even know what I'm saying. I, 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 what I think I'm saying tonight is this. If you feel your buds being pinched, it's not judgment. It's love. Saying not yet. I, I don't have to invite leaders in from the outside. I can have a regular Friday night service in my church and it's nothing but leaders. I would say that's the vast majority of people that attend our church on Friday night were in leadership positions wherever they came from before. And they said, I'd rather have my bud pinched than birth that fruit prematurely. And there's a trust in me that I'm the beloved of the Father and he is not going to let what I'm designed to do waste away. He's just gonna make sure I'm strong enough that when the fruit comes, it doesn't bring destruction. It brings to people life and life abundantly. Thank you, Lord. When you and I get rooted in the revelation of our own identity as the beloved of Abba, we recognize that him pinching our buds is the very opposite of rejection. It's actually a level of care and tenderness that enables us to be untethered from time. Anxiety, how many times have I said this, serves as a witness that you and I have maintained a perverted relationship with time. If you're anxious, it's because you want something to have happened yet. And beloved identity says if it hasn't happened yet, it must not be time. And you talk about rest. You're not late and you're not delayed. You're in his care. And if he needs to pinch another bud, then pinch another bud. Because I believe I'm called to hold some weighty fruit that I'm not yet ready for. Maybe the frustration around what hasn't happened yet needs to be converted into thanksgiving that Abba cares about our well-being more than our production. You can procreate at 12. That doesn't make it a good idea. Jesus tells Mary, I must be about my father's business. Interestingly, it would be Mary that would let him know when it was time again to be about his father's business. What I love about the dialogue, what I love about, maybe I should say what I love about the narrative here, is that Mary, we don't get a response from Mary. Boy, don't talk back to me. Because he can go, I'm God, Mom. No, we get Yeshua 
saying, I trust that even though I have a relationship with the Father no human has ever had before, that he gave me her. I've got a relationship with the Father no human has ever had before, but I believe he gave me Joseph. Jesus gets two, a horizontal and vertical declaration of who he is. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And he was not released to do all he was designed to do until he got affirmation in both directions. One of them, obviously far more important than the other. But I believe people don't make it because they have something with God and have no root connection to anybody else. I believe many true, I I started with them, friend. Do you know how many people that I started in the ministry with that are still in the ministry? Very few. Suicide, jail, divorce, homosexuality, I could go down the list. Not in a judgmental sense, but only a handful of those that I started with have actually remained in the ministry. And for those that I started with that remained in the ministry, none still seeking revival. Because they became, there came this settling. If you're going to make it, you're going to have to settle. And if I ask myself, what's the difference between me and them? It's not who was anointed. It's not who had the call of God on their life. I believe it's somebody that was willing to let somebody knock on the door and tell them you're going to be generic. And somebody ring them up on the phone and say, who am I to you? And when you and I set ourselves to not try to live in isolation and call it freedom, then we're going to get to move into a measure of stability that's actually going to give this thing the grace to last. I want this to last. I don't want to be 10 years from now talking about how God was moving 10 years ago. I want to be 10 years from now looking at this and going, I'm glad we didn't despise the day of small beginnings. That was us just getting started. And I really believe the Father sent me to say to you tonight, if Yeshua needed that kind of authority in his life and he had that measure of relationship with God, then it's foolish for us to think we can just do all of this on our own. And that the prophetic community... Oftentimes, the more mystical she becomes, the less understanding that prophetic community will have about the importance of having authority in your life. And they'll even mock it, and they'll make fun of it, and they'll play it off like it's not a big deal. And I'm here to tell you, it's a big deal. And when God said to me, we moved to Mobile, it's time to expand the roots of the family tree. I knew this was part of it. We dialogued about it. We prayed about it. How do we do this? I felt like the Lord said the first step to this, don't, don't create a network. Don't, don't create an email list. Don't create the phone numbers that people call. Create culture where people can come in and say, you know what, I'm not by myself. I may look crazy to the people that are around me back where I came from, but there's a group of people that are just as crazy as I am, and they won't reject me, and they're not going to cast me off because I'm different and because I'm mystical and because I'm a little out of the box. They're actually going to embrace me and love me, and I believe we can do more than that. I believe we can help people get established and get connected to a root system and become all it is that the Father has designed them to be. Now, I'm not under the illusion uh, that everybody is going to move here or that everybody is supposed to move here. I don't believe that many are. For those that are, come on, we'd be glad to have you. But for those that are called to remain where you are, we're going to throw these doors open from time to time. And we're going to get to know each other organically by throwing these doors open from time to time. And I just want to say to you, before you get back in your vehicle or jump back on an airplane or however you're getting home, I just want to say to you that you are not by yourself. And this is not some tongue-in-cheek language. I'm saying to you that we are creating a culture where people can come be a part of something and say, I'm not alone. There are other people that are hearing what I'm hearing. I heard that so many times today. When I heard your voice, I knew that I wasn't crazy. And the things God had been, have you heard the same thing? The things God had been saying to me, he was saying to somebody else. Or or I had these thoughts and God used you to put language to it. I want to say to you, that's an indicator that the Father wants you to get joined in the middle of all that he's doing. We're not going to ask for no tithe money from you. We're not going to set up no network where you give. You should give. If you don't give, something's wrong with you. 
biggest checks I've written in my life going right here in this direction before I would give them anywhere else. I would make, even after I got liberated from the tithe, I never stopped sowing and giving. One of the first things we're able to do right now is provide salary for them. The same salary that they had. We gave them a little bit more for the rest of their lives. That's awesome. If that means we don't get a salary, doesn't matter. They'll never not receive. Now, I'm not talking about they get retirement. And as this increases, I'll increase what they're give, what's given to them. This is, what, this is right. They, they pioneered this. They're the foundation of this. But I want you to understand that you can be connected to something so much bigger than where you go to church once a week. So much bigger than some denomination that your grandfather was a part of. God bless them, but let's move on. And let's gather around fathers and get established inside of community. Let me give you the last part of this and we'll shift. What do I do with my glasses? Oh, there they are. I can't see my glasses without my glasses. <laughs> Funny thing. I believe Yeshua could have produced supernatural fruit at 12, but the father instead sends him home to Joseph's to learn that father's business. Hmm. If he's pinching your buds, maybe, just maybe, it's not because he's disappointed with you. Maybe, just maybe, it's because he's more committed to your inner structure than he is to your outward fruit. After all, he most likely has a definition, a different definition of fruit than we do anyway. Let me say it again. After all, he probably has a different definition of fruit than we do anyway. Mary, not Mama Mary, Magdalene Mary, standing outside the tomb weeping. John 20. She gets up early in the morning to go anoint the body of the Lord. She gets there and finds that the body of the Lord is gone and she runs back. She gets Peter and John. You want to jump up there for me, Ty? She gets Peter and John. because it's a picture of the apostolic and prophetic working in concert. John, who had this revelation. John, who had this prophetic seeing eye. John, who would write for us revelation. Peter, who would become the apostle to the Jews. She knew those two had a history of working together. And she knew John could find out where he was, and if John could find out where he was, Peter could get to whatever John found. After all, when a ghost comes to him walking on the water, it's John who knows who he is, but it's Peter that gets out of the boat because prophetic ministry sees what God's doing and apostolic ministry reaches and takes hold of what the Lord is doing. Remember after the, feel the Holy Ghost. Remember after the resurrection, they fished all night and couldn't catch anything and a random guy shows up on the shore and says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And when they bring the fish in, John says, it is the Lord. Peter girds himself with his fisherman cloak, dives into the water and starts swimming toward the Lord. What happened? The prophetic in the life of John saw it, but the prophetic needed the apostolic to swim toward what John had the revelation to see. So Mary said, go get those two. Because they need to run together. Peter and John went up together at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour and found a lame man that was carried and laid daily at a gate called Beautiful. Something happens when you find the right person to run with and the two of you make the decision to run together. So Mary walks into the house and when her baby in her fluids makes contact with Elizabeth's baby in his fluids, the babies begin to jump while they're in the fluids. So when they were in that river and one was getting ready to baptize the other, make no mistake, when those two get in the fluids together, something begins to happen. Wow. You got to find a group of people that you can get in the river with. You got to find a group of people you can go deep with. You got to find a group of people that are not going to judge you when you let your hair down and say, I didn't come in here to show off my outfit. I came in here to go deeper than I've ever been before. So let all the makeup fly off, shake the weave out of your hair if you got to. But we're going to go as deep as the Father has invited us to go. Hallelujah. She said, go get Peter and John. Peter and John started to run together. John got there first. 
John looks into the tomb, doesn't see anything. Peter goes right past John, goes into the tomb, doesn't see anything. They leave, not sure what has happened. And after they left, the Mary who had already looked in the tomb and not seen a thing, decided she wasn't satisfied with what she had seen. She wanted more. She stoops down, wipes the tears out of her eyes, and the Bible said she looked again. And when she looked, she saw two angels, one sitting at the head and the other sitting at the feet where the body of the Lord had lain. I've been preaching for 20 years, that's the mercy seat. An angel at the head and an angel at the feet. An angel at the head and the angel, there was a new seat called mercy and it was not over a wood box covered with gold. It was where the son of God had come out with resurrection power and laid the linen cloth where his body used to be. Mary looked again, she stooped down and as she stooped down, she looked again. Said, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? She heard a voice from behind. And the Bible said she's supposing him to be the gardener. She was right. He'd been the planter all along. And maybe in resurrection power, he was back in his gardening state. And when she looked at him, she saw a planter in there. What was he doing? He was planting the seeds of a new kingdom. He was planting the seeds of a new heaven and he was planting the seeds of a new earth. And he was making the declaration from this point forward, I am putting the seeds in the ground and none of this is ever, ever, ever gonna look the same again. And rather than using an apostle or a prophet to make the announcement of the greatest news that had ever been heard in the history of the world, that the Christ had been resurrected, he lets a woman carry the message because she was willing to stick around and look for more, even if she had to look through tears. I want to tell you, if you haven't seen what you're looking for yet, keep on looking trust when your buds are being pinched it's because of his care not because of his lack of care I wanted it to happen by now I wanted it to happen by now maybe it's bigger than you thought have you ever thought maybe it's heavier than you thought maybe you think you're ready because you don't know how heavy it is Salah (laughs) I want to look at Isaiah 61. Spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim captives will be released. Prisoners will be freed. Verse two, he has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. Now you under, note, notice in Luke four, Jesus omits the last part of that. Verse three, to all who mourn in Israel, he'll give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. What does the revelation of righteousness do? Establishes the oaks. And it's the oaks that bring forth his glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. Verse (laughs) 5. Foreigners will be your servants. They'll feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. You will be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You will feed on the treasures of the nations and boast in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you'll enjoy a double share of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. There's your new definition of fruit. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will, I'm sorry, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make everlasting covenant with them. Listen to this. Their descendants will be recognized and honored among the nations. Everyone will realize that they are the people that the Lord has blessed. 
I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. The sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in early spring with plants springing up everywhere. You're the oaks of righteousness that can travel back and find the day when you needed beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And because you have accepted the exchange and you have received your beloved identity, the Lord is now inviting you to be planted so that you can be more with a believer with a revelation some other believers may not have. You can actually become a planted, established one and allow your roots to be intertwined with others for the glory of God. a lot of things in my life if I could go back and do different I certainly would go back and do different but my tethering to an apostle is something I'd do a million times over again and I, my mom and dad sitting in here saying if they could encourage me to do something a million times over again it'd be my tethering to an apostle I I know this may sound strange to you, but I want to talk to people who may not have found anywhere you fit. Now you have. I traveled all over the world for 20 years. And it didn't matter where I traveled. It didn't matter what I was going through. It didn't matter what I was facing. When I walked back in this building, there was a smell in this building that told me two things. You're home and everything will be okay. And many of you have heard me say that many times, even before I lived here. There's a smell in that building that told me you're home and everything's gonna be okay. Little did I know that was gonna be home and everything would indeed be okay. And now that smell gets to be your smell that lets you know you're home and everything's gonna be okay. So I want you to just, I just felt like the Father said to me today to receive you. I just want to uh, share some things also as, as he is a father and the experience of some of you will be fathers may be already in the process of that in their own houses. Some things you'll experience, especially when you have one like this comes along. And I, when, when Robbie and I um, had moved here, when well, the story of leaving there in Millbrook was absolutely the toughest day. I announced that I've never cried so much in my life and but I knew I had to do that I had to find my apostle and he wasn't there but I'll never forget Ike and Anita and when Ike moved us and you know, he's saying now you know we can move you back anytime and he moved us and when we got there to Panama City he said um, uh, now we can turn right around and go back and boy you know how much I wanted to especially my first meeting with that apostle there in Panama City <laughs> And then um, he said, you just call me and we'll do what we need to do. But um, we knew it was right. It was not easy. But during that process, when I was, we were sent here in 1990 by uh, F. Nolan Ball, uh, very difficult. I, I needed that strong apostle in my life to face what I was going to face here. And we did. But I'll never forget, Damon always made sure that he was in, in the middle of everything. The first service that we had. I spoke, I wouldn't say preach, I'm not a preacher, this is a preacher. I spoke everything I had and every, all, all, all that I knew in that one service. I had no idea what I was gonna say next, you know what I mean? <laughs> they were there, they were there in the very first service. Who would have known? Now, what happened then after that, he, he would come occasionally and he and Jeff came, that was great. But I remember when I knew something was gonna be big and different, I knew there's a difference in it was when we were, he was coming to spend the weekend with us. You remember that Jeep you had that didn't even have an air conditioner in it? 
didn't have an air conditioner in it. It was a stripped down thing. I don't think even had sides to it very much. Doors or anything on it. You're in, you're in Alabama, in South Alabama. It's hot. And here it comes, and I knew it was coming. I was out on the front porch waiting, and we we're in a neighborhood, and I hear something coming down the road. I go, what is that? What is that? I'm like, hear the sound. Do you remember that? And it was, I, and I hear this, of something going on real loud. I'm going, what is going on? And here comes Damon around the corner uh, in his Jeep with a cassette tape. And he was memorizing. So he applied himself, not just a gift, applying himself. Memorizing, I have a dream. With all of his being, you remember that? He was memorizing with the original tape recording of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s message, I have a dream. He was a young man. How old were you? Eight, 18, 17 years old. Memorizing. He was preaching it then. And when he got there, I was struck by it. I said, oh my. And he always says, what you going to do with that? I said, you know. <laughs> you know. And it was a process. And I'll never forget when he, he was, when we first started having Don and Reba that had that revealable, I call it a revealable. Not revival. Not revival. It was revealable. It revealed everybody's heart. Okay. <laughs> and it was ugly. That was rough, man. That was rough. Love them. They did a great job, man. But uh, that was a rough, rough time. But uh, Damon came in with a, with, with a guy he was, he was pastoring. He, he was an associate pastor at a small church there in, in Prattville. And he came in to visit during those meetings, six weeks of meetings. And he came in, I asked him, I said, hey man, why don't you say a prayer over the offering? <laughs> well, he didn't just say a prayer, he preached it. And, and Donnie looked at me like, where did you get him? And I knew there was a sound in him. He said, oh my goodness. And so then he eventually invited him to a place out in Texas to speak. He was too young to bring into the big service, they called it. They let him speak out to the youth, big, big church. And when people started getting healed, they moved into the big church. And everything changed, though, in his life. And I'll never forget that it began, it got scary for me. I was excited for him. Scary. I knew what was about to happen. And and, and uh, but, but every time I'd get anxious for him, I remembered one thing, your daddy. Smart. Always knew that you would never be fooled. You would look and you'd give everything a chance, but you would not be fooled. So fathers, father, <laughs> they'll not be fooled. Know that is what's in them. And I, I knew that no matter how much he would be promoted and celebrated, and he, he really was, and he had the anointing to do that. I had a desire, of course, I had this desire in me to, man, bring him in my church, a little small church. He'd blow this thing out of the out. God said, no, 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 no. Don't you dare do that. You'll be willing to do that, guys. Look, I had him in my church. And he always says, no, 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 you're, you're to protect him. He's my treasure, as they all are. I build the house the way I build the house. You love him, protect him, and you be willing to tell him no. No, when everybody's going to tell him yes because they want him and what he, he can do for them, you be willing to tell him no. He may not want to be around you for a long time. You tell him no. He'll know that you will tell him the truth when everybody else just wants what they can get out of him. We built that relationship that way. I'll never forget one time, one more little story. My brother was in transition. He was on our staff, and we had just a, it was time to get my brother what he should be doing. He's a builder. I can't build a doghouse. If I did, a dog wouldn't get in it. Okay. My brother can build the Empire State Building. Okay. So we got him in the role he needed to be doing. And so he was building his first house over in uh, Fairhope. And I, we all had to be all hands on deck and help. And so as a family, I was in painting the side and, I, and inside the house. I'm not a painter, but I was trying. And uh, we were doing all our part. 
and painted some trim. It was terrible. But, um, and Damon looked me up. He said, I need to come see you. And I knew they'd, he'd been discovered by now. Okay. And he looked me up. He said, I got to see you now. I said, all right. He came and, and we were in there painting. And he, I, he, he, he took a paintbrush. We were in there painting. He was real pale, frightened. I said, what's, 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 what's up, son? He said, I'm frightened. He said, they, could, they said they could make me. I said, well, what do you think about that? We're painting on the, he's, he's painting one side, painting the other. <laughs> and I'm going, what do you think about that? You know, somebody offered to buy him a jet one time. Hey, this is a wisdom from his daddy right here, okay? Offered to buy him a jet one time. He said, awesome, may I sell it? Think about it. He said, because I know I have to say that jet sitting out there. I got to pay for the jet sitting there. And the people involved, in, that's that smart side. I said, you doggone right, give me a jet. You know what I mean? Then I'd be in trouble. <laughs> but not, not him. The wisdom that was in him from his father and his mother, just to count the cost of something, even though it was a gift of something big. He had all these things being offered to him. And he says, I'm frightened. I said, well, you'll know what to do. And you'll know when to do it. Sometimes you'll know you need to run. I knew there's some churches that were after him just for his gift. And I knew that sometimes, even those churches, he needed to be there for a while. To give a chance. And I knew some that just needed him and some that he's supposed to be at. He'd call me sometime the church's staff would be twice as big as our church. And, and they'd say, why are you, where are you? How big is that church where your, where your apostle is? And he said, your staff is twice as big as his church. And they're going, why? Look how, you know, and he said, he'll tell me no. <laughs> he loves me enough that we're, he's willing to do that. And I'm thankful for Apostle Paul put that in me. And because we, we, you'll be challenged for the treasure of your people, not ever to be jealous of them. Oh, man. Celebrate them all out and know they're going to be all right if they got that in him. He knew how to say no himself. You get it? Be willing to say no and to say no, even though they may disappear a while. They'll come back because they know you love them not for the gift, but for who they are. Their gifting of who they are to you, the treasure of who they are. That's the deal. It's that you're stewards over the Father's treasure. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom and be better take care of it. Yes, He'll honor you with it. That morning he talks about that went to, to his house. Man, I, I, I struggled all night. I didn't want to do that. He was prospering, doing good. He was steady as it goes, you know. But man, he always says, they're, they're, if they get him, he'll be generic. He's not generic. Now, he didn't look generic. Boom. But generic to the plan that they had lined up for him. I said, you'll be generic. You'll never do that unique thing. And I knew it made him mad. <laughs> but I knew he loved me. And I, he knew I loved him. And those are the important things as fathers. It's in you to tell them as much as you love them. He'll tell you things. And, and you'll know he tells you because he loves you. He, he wants you to succeed more than you could ever imagine. There's a thing where the fathers really put you on their shoulders to lift you higher. To go farther. You may see more than they do. I'm going with them though. Yes, sir. It's no longer that where I, I, I can't see it anymore. I get to go with you, man. Look at this. I get to go with him. I get to see. And when Yahweh says, come celebrate the next generation, and he brought all this in, and our grandbabies thank me more than anything. Because they got friends now out everywhere. Our grandbabies have, and to see all these teenagers, these children, thank you for hearing the word from me to say, come home. Thank you. What a gift to me. Now think back to those days. You get it? So be willing. Yahweh has a great plan. And it overcomes you later when you don't even realize. I mean, this was lonely days we've had. Tiny days. Tiny, tiny things going on. <laughs> but there comes a day. He'll overtake you. He'll overtake you. I'm in that place. I'm being overtaken. Thank you. I love you. I love you. 
Love you guys. Y'all are amazing. Amazing. Thank you. I love you. Love you, Tammy. <laughs> it's worth it. Every bit of it. Thank you, Lord. We throw the doors wide open to you. We say, welcome home. May the scent of what the Father has established here always make you know you're home and everything's going to be okay. You can't make this kind of stuff happen. He's good. We honor you. We love you. We bless you. If you're going to be back here tomorrow night, awesome. If you're not, safe travels. We bless you. We want to send you forth from this place. Father, I speak blessing, protection, provision over your people. I thank you for those that have been willing to come and jump in with us and honor what you're doing in the earth. I pray that they have become more tender than they ever imagined that they could be. And I thank you, Father, that in that tenderness, they are allowed to be a part of a root system, to become a part of this greater family and to see incredible things happen as the leaves of these trees are indeed used for the healing of the nations. In the awesome name of Yeshua the Christ, amen. We love you. Bless you. See you tomorrow night.